All right. I apologize for the delay. Can everybody hear me okay? Wonderful. Welcome back to Grand Rounds for the Department of Medicine. I'm John Hickman, one of the chief residents. It is a pleasure to be back, and we have light as well. Uh, thank you for being here today. We're one on separate systems, so I think we should be okay. Um, on behalf of Dr. Frazier, our chair, Dr. Costco Spencer, and myself, again, thank you for being here. We're so glad to have the Charles Parker Lecture, with a fantastic lecture about whom you hear more in a moment. Very briefly, I want to let you know we have a new QR code at the end for some feedback about Grand Rounds. We'd love to hear your thoughts on past talks, today's talk, upcoming speakers you'd like to hear. So please send some feedback our way. We'd love to use it. Here to introduce our speaker, we have Dr. James Wedner. Um, he is the current director of the Asthma and Allergy Center WashU. And in the interest of time, I'll stop there. Dr. Wedner, thank you for being here. So just a brief correction. I was the director of the Asthma. Dr. Kendall, Dr. Kendall was kind enough to relieve me of that uh, job. So I, it's a, a delight to introduce the eight Charles Parker uh, lectureship. Um, I worked with our, Dr. Parker for a number of years. I started my fellowship with him just about 50 years ago uh, last June. So Charlie was a unique individual, had multiple interests but most of them were resolved around organic chemistry. So he started his career working with the late Herman Eisen, doing antigen antibody interactions, invented something called fluorescent quenching, which allowed him to actually measure antigen antibody interactions. Um, he then decided to do chemistry of the penicillins, and he was able to show that there was a major minor determinant and to develop procedures which we literally use today. So the pre-pen that we use to uh, do penicillin skin testing was actually published first by Charlie in 1964. Using that, he then used his other techniques to develop methods for measuring captain drug interactions with IgG. Uh, he also did some work on antigen antibody uh, conjugates for tumor immunotherapy. He then moved to radio immunoassays, which as you remember were a very prominent back in the early uh, 70s and 80s. He developed uh, creatinine kinase, first uh, RIA for hepatitis B, for digitoxin, for morphine, for prostaglandins, and then finally for cyclic AMP and GMP, an area that I worked in uh, for many years. He then moved to something which was then called slow reacting substance of anaphylaxis or SLSA. And it's now known as the leukotrienes. He was the first one to demonstrate that leukotrienes were an arachidonic acid metabolite. He demonstrated the side chain of LPC4 was actually glutathione. He demonstrated that glutathione deficient cells could not make leukotrienes. And this led to a greater understanding of mast cell biology. Finally, I'd like to tell you that our current speaker joins a very auspicious list of Parker lecturers. And I'll tell you a little bit about Scott. He uh, did his initial college at Wake Forest with a degree in biology, then went to the Medical University of South Carolina for his MD, PhD, and then he went to Virginia where he was a resident and ultimately a fellow with Dr. Tom Platt Mill. Currently, he is an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at the University of North Carolina. So he's been intimately involved in what's been called alpha-gal sensitivity, something he's going to talk about today, a disease which five years ago nobody ever heard of, and today half of my patients claim they have it. Um, he also is very interested in food hypersensitivity, uh, he published widely multiple articles and multiple food chapters, uh, uh, book chapters. For this lecture, we generally weigh someone's CV to see if they make the grade and his CV. It's my pleasure to introduce Scott as the eighth Charles W. Parker lecture.
thank you for the kind introduction and the opportunity to be here and uh, present the, the Parker lecture. Um, we've, we've just heard um, these things that Dr. Dr. Parker had, had done. Um, two things particularly came to my mind and the slow reacting substance of anaphylaxis is, is in some ways very near and dear to my heart because I'm gonna tell you about a delayed allergic reaction um, that we haven't ruled out could be due to the slow reactant substance of anaphylaxis or leukotrienes. But probably um, the thing that I found that Dr. Parker did that really resonated with me was actually a few sentences in a, in a 1991 article that he wrote entitled Environmental Stress and Immunity, the Possible Implication for IgE-Mediated Allergy. And in that, in the introduction, he says, in response to microbial invasion, mammals undergo a complex response that rapidly increases specific and nonspecific host resistance. And I think there are themes on this that you'll see throughout the talk that I'm gonna give. Um, so this is, uh, this is what the title is, The Emerging Epidemic of Alpha-Gal Allergy Reveals About Tolerance to Food. These are my disclosures. As we all know, it takes a village to do science these days, so I don't like to save this slide for the end um, because these are the people who really do the work. So it's um, a lot of what I'm gonna show you today is, is from Shalesh Chowdhury, who, who runs my lab, um, but I'm very grateful to the collaborators as well as our alpha-gal study subjects. The story of alpha-gal allergy or alpha-gal syndrome, I may call it AGS for short, actually begins in the mid 2000s. We became aware of two distinct forms of anaphylaxis. This was largely going on in Tom Platts Mills lab who I um, was training with at the University of Virginia. <clears throat> we became aware of allergic reactions to a cancer medication called cetuximab or Herbitux. <clears throat> These reactions were immediate. So first infusion, which really gets any allergist's attention. Someone who's never had a medication and reacts in a IgE mediated uh, way that is consistent with anaphylaxis, the first time they get a medicine gets our attention. These were consistent. It happened at each infusion and it was regional. Missouri included in this group of states shown here in red. Um, Around the same time, we actually became aware of allergic reactions that were happening after patients consumed beef, pork, or lamb. Interestingly, these were delayed, completely inconsistent, but also regional. It turns out that both syndromes of anaphylaxis be, be, become explained by a, an IgE response to this sugar galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, which I'll call alpha-gal for short. So just to give you a, a little bit of a background on alpha-gal, it's shown here next to blood group uh, antigen B, where it, it shares a lot of similarity. But the critical structure moiety in alpha-gal is this alpha-1,3 linkage uh, shown here. As humans, we actually don't have alpha-gal. We're largely alpha-gal knockouts. We have a gene, but it encodes a, a, a premature stop codon. So we don't actually make the functional galactosal transferase enzyme. <clears throat> However, critical for our work is that all lower mammals have alpha-gal. The original publication uh, in 2009 only included 24 patients. These were patients who told us that they thought they were allergic to beef, pork, or lamb. At that point, we hadn't challenged them. This was by report only. 19 of them were from Central Virginia, five actually from Southern Missouri. Their symptoms were delayed by report, three to six hours. Their skin tests, when we tried to do skin prick tests, were often quite small. We actually had to do intradermal testing to demonstrate the skin response but their blood tested positive for IgE to alpha gal. We felt as though the next step in that was to really demonstrate in a controlled manner that in fact, these reactions were both valid 
and delayed. And after um, thinking about various ways in which um, we could create the challenge, it became fairly clear that pork sausage would be the best opportunity for this. They have to eat it early in the morning, so we had to have something that we could feed folks early and then wait six hours potentially to see the results of the reaction. So we tried to find a breakfast food. We tried prosciutto for a little bit. Turns out you can't eat really enough prosciutto uh, to, to trigger the reaction. So uh, pork sausage fit that bill and equally, um, it turns out that the fattier meat seemed to be more of an issue. So I just wanted to show you a few uh, slides from our, our challenge experiments. This is a before photo of one of our early subjects whose specific IgE to alpha-gal was 9.3. His total IgE is 204. Uh, we did put IVs in and we would take blood every hour, which becomes important in a couple of slides. Um, and, and he eats two and a half pork sausage patties. Um, and at the end of the six hours, he had a, a small itch in his lower back, but really nothing to show. And so I actually let him go home thinking that Either we hadn't fed him enough or this is that inconsistent portion of the allergy. And on the way home, he called to say, that area on my back that was just slightly itchy is now really bothering me. And so I said, well, when you get home, take a picture and, and send it to me. So his, his wife texts me this picture after they've gotten home. And I was regretting that I'd let him go. Um, but said, you know, go ahead and give, give him a long acting antihistamine, a short acting antihistamine, and, and please update me in 30 minutes. He was having no trouble breathing. Um, and we felt like at that point, we should at least just give a first round of medication. So I was surprised when a half hour later, she sent me these pictures um, that showed his torso covered uh, in erythema and whelps. And when I called, she said, well, I wanted to see what would happen. So she in fact hadn't given him the antihistamines and he never had any trouble breathing. They're still married, um, but it did teach us a, an important lesson that, that it really is a slow to evolve um, allergic reaction, perhaps quite consistent with the slow reacting substance of anaphylaxis. This is another patient um, whose alpha-gal IgE was slightly higher. She reacted almost at four hours um, after, after eating pork sausage. Um, and hers began as itching and flushing and then progressed. She ultimately uh, required epinephrine. I included this photo. Um, the the pre-photo is, is on, on your left. Um, and the, the initial portion of her reaction is shown on your right. There's a portion of patients who really describe palmar erythema and itch associated with these uh, alpha-gal related reactions. It also makes the point that if you have a, a body portion of focus, you should make sure that you fully include that in the before photo. Um, but I hope you can trust me that after about four hours, um, her, her hands, palms began to itch uh, and swell. So I mentioned that we put an IV in and took blood every hour. And part of that was to try to understand what was happening with the delay. And this, this slide sort of speaks to that. So this is on the y-axis CD63 expression, which is an activation marker for basophils. And shown on the, the x-axis is the hours into challenge. And all we did was take blood out of the IV every hour and then fixed it and stained it. We didn't activate it ex vivo at all. So the, the, the CD63 activation that you're seeing, we think really was occurring um, in, in vivo. And I think what it makes the point is twofold. One is that for, for some patients, they really have a reaction that begins to start around three hours. And other patients, their basophil activation really peaks closer to six. And Strikingly, this activation seems to correlate with their clinical, the onset of their clinical symptoms. And I think the second point this, this slide makes is that the antigen itself actually appears slow to get into circulation. 
when we would stimulate basophils um, from patients that have IgE to alpha-gal in the typical 30-minute basophil activation test, they react right on time. So it's not a failure of the basophils to react. It really seems as though the antigen is slow to get into the bloodstream. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about just the typical presentation of this syndrome, because it is a little bit unique. And I think as um, clinicians both here and um, on video, if we can prevent one patient from ending up in the emergency department um, after having anaphylaxis, then I hope I will have done my job. So the original, what I call the original AGS uh, presentation is that where patients have a fatty meat or perhaps uh, uh, a high, high fat dairy such as pizza or ice cream, and they end up with hives, itching, swelling, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, hypotension, anaphylaxis. These were the patients who were in our initial uh, publication of 24. The typical story for this would be a 56-year-old woman awoken from sleep at 1 a.m. due to itching. Um, she noted that her palms were red and swollen. When she turned on her bedside lamp, her torso was covered in hives. She reported feeling intense gastrointestinal cramping develop, and she collapsed on the way to the bathroom. The noise awakened her husband who called 911. Sounds strange, but this is the, this is the typical way this presents. In collecting the history, we understood that she had leg of lamb at restaurant for dinner earlier that evening, and they enjoyed a particularly good bottle of wine with dinner. In this scenario, then we would typically run the alpha-gal IgE test. It would be positive, and we would make the diagnosis based on the clinical history and the supporting lab results. The management in this scenario typically is of course to ask the patient to remove mammalian meat from their diet, especially fatty cuts. And often we, we talk a bit about dairy, including the higher fat forms of dairy. Many people though are okay with dairy. And those who tolerate cheese, we actually, I tend to leave it in their diet. There are occasionally patients who have issues with gelatin. So marshmallows, gummy bears, medications with gelatin become an issue. We often talk a fair amount about exercise and alcohol. Turns out in adult food allergy, exercise and alcohol play a big role in triggering these reactions. We tend to monitor the alpha-gal IgE over time, and then occasionally we'll do a pork sausage challenge uh, when their level declines significantly. One of the interesting things we've learned is that while initially we thought of this as a sort of a red meat allergy, I really think it's better described as a syndrome because it turns out we are incredibly efficient at the way in which we utilize cattle and pigs in, the process, in their processing. So there are a tremendous number of products that derive um, and have mammalian ingredients in them. It's not to say that someone with AGS can't use a crayon. It's just to say that the ingredients from pigs and cows um, are ubiquitously in, uh, present in our daily lives. So I think it's best described as a syndrome. So there are a few other clinical presentations that I just wanna commend to the group. And, and the main one is, is the second one we were, totally unaware of this at the time when we described um, the syndrome initially, and that is the GI only phenomenon. And these are patients who exclusively have gastrointestinal symptoms from red meat and or dairy. Um, occasionally those, those symptoms are not as fully delayed, so they may develop um, crushing abdominal pain within two hours of, of eating red meat. A typical scenario of this would be a 48-year-old man from a Green County, Missouri, who presented the ED with what he called life-ending abdominal pain. It was his third acute care episode for abdominal pain in the past six months. An abdominal ultrasound was performed and several non-obstructing gallstones were noted. Cholecystectomy was performed. Two months later, he returns to the ED with the same complaint. I tell you, this is not facetious, this happens. 
was referred to GI for further workup. His alpha-gal level was positive. Trial of red meat avoidance resulted in no additional episodes over the past six months. So if we can help educate anyone who sees folks in the middle of the night and just because the scenario may fit with uh, something that seems like it could be acute cholecystitis, I think it's worth taking a good history and thinking about alpha-gal, particularly in the places um, in the US and abroad where I'll show you location-wise. So we've just published um, a case series of, of, of um, roughly 16 uh, individuals in conjunction with some of the my gastro and uh, Enterology colleagues at the University of North Carolina. Um, and abdominal pain was present in 88%, uh, accompanied by nausea and diarrhea, mainly episodic um, and chronic. And those were the most common symptoms. Nine patients actually met the criteria for diarrhea predominant IBS. My sense is that there's going to be some people we're going to find now who are in IBS clinics who actually have AGS. So we're working on that as well. Um, the median time from symptom onset to diagnosis was 21 months, which is why I think it's worth bringing up um, in hopes that we can make this diagnosis quicker. So there are um, a few other lessons in the, in the GI um, side of things. And one is pancreatic enzymes. Um, and shown here is skin testing from a patient who, was, who has alpha-gal allergy um, who was commended, referred to us for um, possible consideration of whether she could tolerate pancreatic enzymes because these are often uh, porcine derived. And I think it's worth doing the skin testing when this comes up. Um, as you can see, we, we avoided uh, biokinase, pertzyme, Zenpep for her. She's done well on Creon. I think these are uh, the type of, of skin tests that we probably need to validate more, but it certainly does raise the possibility that skin testing for pancreatic enzymes in patients with AGS may have uh, a role in helping guide um, the selection of the appropriate enzyme. As I mentioned, we are concerned that, um, that a portion of IBS really may be related to AGS, and my sense is that where you live uh, really may matter. And we, as we think about the management of this, it's also important to um, you know, think about the various uh, internal medicine subspecialties. I've told you a little bit about the GI implications. This is one of the, of the cardiology implications. We actually had, it wasn't on our radar initially. We thought of AGS as a food allergy, but the idea that you can uh, take a porcine valve and put it in a patient with AGS and, and cause uh, an allergic reaction seems to be true. Um, we had a patient who had a mitral valve uh, replacement with a porcine valve and had perioperative anaphylaxis. So there's more work that clearly needs to be done here. Despite fixation, um, and um, removal of epitopes, decellularization of these valves, it's pretty clear in the literature, especially recently, that the alpha-gal epitope survives these fixation processes. So in addition to whether someone reacts acutely to a valve placement, I think one of the other unanswered potential questions here is, you know, our cardiology colleagues will tell us that there are, are some patients, when, when, you, when you place a valve, some have early valve failure. And so one of our concerns is, could a portion of early valve failure be related to alpha-gal epitopes that remain um, on the valves? How deep this goes in terms of pericardial patches and premature failure are, um, remains to be seen. I think the complicating part in a lot of this is that at the time of valve placement, patients receive a bolus of heparin, right, which is derived from porcine and bovine sources. So we do have some bit of work to do to, to further understand how much of what we've seen in the past is due to reaction to the valve versus heparin. And then uh, Dr. Platts Mills's group, uh, particularly at the University of Virginia, raised this idea that um, in a cohort of patients who 
were at, uh, enrolled simply because they had chest pain. Um, they underwent cardiac catheterization and intravascular ultrasound. In that group, they were later um, had serum assays done for alpha-gal IgE and found that 26% of those patients had alpha-gal specific IgE. And it appeared that the plaques in the sensitized group had less stable features on intravascular ultrasound. So whether there's a correlation here between the pro-inflammatory IgE component um, and atherosclerosis, I think remains to be seen, but certainly a, an interesting topic. On the endocrine side, I would ask people to be aware of Armour Thyroid, uh, which is a natural preparation derived from porcine thyroid gland. On the infectious disease side, um, this I think is more of interest, just that um, the idea of increasing the, the human, our endogenous anti-alpha-gal response may be a way to help protect against Chagas disease, and perhaps um, other infections. It's being, being tried in malaria as well, uh, because both of those organisms have alpha-gal as an epitope on it. On the rheumatology side, I usually advise uh, our rheumatology colleagues to use some caution with abatacept and infliximab in patients that have alpha-gal IgE, because the data suggests that both can contain low amounts of alpha gal. We've seen a few reactions, but, but not, fortunately, not many. On the nephrology side, this has evolved very recently. You've probably seen this headline uh, where the surgeons attached a pig kin kidney to a human and it worked. Turns out that pig kid kidney came from a porcine model that has had alpha gal uh, inactivated. So it's a GGTA1 knockout or an alpha-gal knockout pig. And uh, we have a lot of interest in these, in these animals, um, potentially as a safe source of, of porcine-derived medical products for patients with AGS, in addition to potentially being a safe source of, of pork. In general, um, the management of uh, patients with AGS, I think, crosses many subspecialties um, and also includes this idea of gelatin-based volume expanders, less of an issue in the U.S., but um, a, certainly a, a, a bigger issue um, internationally. Uh, many vaccines have some version of gelatin in them as a stabilizer, um, and those are listed there. Profab, it turns out, um, you know, is, is derived uh, from mammal sources. Other products that either contain or may contain gelatin are, are listed here. So it, I really think this drives home the point that it, it, it's more of a syndrome perhaps than a, than a food allergy. The second portion of this is to think about why does, why does alpha-gal syndrome start? What, what what, what changes in a 50-year-old person who's successfully eaten beef, pork, or lamb uh, for several decades to where all of a sudden they now have a specific IgE response and end up with delayed anaphylaxis? It turns out we think that ticks are the answer. So the, this is um, a picture of a colleague's foot who had numerous seed tick bites. It looks like chigger bites. And this becomes a big issue. I think when we talk to patients, we really have to broaden the idea of tick bites. It's not just an attached adult tick that, that may or may not be engorged. We really have to start to think about um, asking the question in a, in a different way. So I typically ask about ticks, seed ticks, and chigger bites. Um, not that I'm entirely focused on chiggers, just often it looks like this, and, and if you don't ask, they won't tell you. So the way the story goes is that um, we actually had serum on this individual um, bank from May of 2009. His alpha-gal IgE was negative. You can see his total IgE there. Over the summer, he goes hiking, gets tick bites. The picture is from August, has a reaction in... September to lamb, 
Um, and uh, when he returned, we checked his alpha-gal IgE in October. It's positive at 48.3, and then it continues to rise in November. The only thing that we could really put together was that perhaps this bad episode of seed tick bites was part of the story. Um, and it, you know, it, it becomes a difficult scenario. That is, how do we prove that tick bites are the cause since we don't generally go around just putting ticks on humans? So we weren't necessarily focused on tick bites and I had enrolled um, probably 120 patients in our initial studies. So I went back after this and, and we began to sort of call, we began to call people and ask, you know, we know you, we've been doing the study, we, we weren't focused on tick bites at the time, but I just have a question, have you ever been bitten by ticks? Um, and I typically would say, and that would include the tiny ticks, seed ticks, and perhaps something that might look like a chicker bite. And you can see in the red triangles, the patients, the study subjects who responded that in fact they had been bitten um, and those in the black triangles had no history of tick bites. And there's a, there's a small group um, with a, a high total IgE on the x-axis and a fairly low alpha-gal specific IgE on the y-axis and they're in the black circles and, and, and they specifically denied tick bites. And it turns out when I went back to their, um, their study uh, inclusion documents, almost all of them had severe atopic dermatitis were included in our cohort because they had an alpha-gal positive IgE, but they didn't technically fit sort of that clinical scenario of delayed middle of the night um, allergic reactions. So this is the type of data that we would love to be able to have where we have a patient who we diagnose um, on July 10th in this scenario, um, after having a, a bad reaction um, and her alpha-gal IgE is positive um, around five, her total IgE is, is shown there around 22. And then she works in the garden, gets 50, 60, 70 uh, tick bites from, from tiny seed ticks, comes back and lets us draw blood in a serial way. This data is precious, but it's really difficult to come by. And ideally we would prefer to have a specific IgE that predated her reaction. So we could even see this before, but it's incredibly difficult to do. You can see after the tick bites, um, her specific and total IgE rise and then, be then begin to wane. But I think it's ultimately a thing that we needed to move to an animal model, which is what we've been doing. So this is some data from alpha-gal knockout mice. We had to use that because a normal wild type mouse would have alpha-gal and therefore probably not likely to respond uh, in a specific IgE type manner to an autoantigen. So we work with Shahid Karim, um, who is at the University of Southern Mississippi. He's an expert in uh, tick biology, and he supplies us with tick salivary gland extract, which we inject um, subcutaneously as close to intradermal as we can in our alpha-gal uh, knockout mice to try to raise their alpha-gal specific IgE. And um, that is shown on your left. And you can see that those injected with TSGE um, do develop an alpha-gal specific IgE response. And then when we challenge these mice with pork kidney homogenate, it turns out that porcine kidney has one of the highest expressions of alpha gal. That's why we use that. Um, and in murine models of food allergy, the way we measure allergic reactions is a decrease in their body temperature. So um, following challenge, um, you can appreciate that uh, those in uh, the green triangles that are both sensitized and fed uh, pork kidney homogenate drop their body temperature. Um, and the others that are sensitized or non-sensitized uh, do not. So we felt as though this is the type of data that we really needed to be able to generate to say, we suspected ticks, but now we really think that ticks are part of, if not the only cause for this. Um, and, it, and it does appear to be uh, something that we can replicate in our, in our animal models. Um, 
more recently, we've used um, a port kidney homogenate from the uh, alpha-gal knockout um, pigs that I showed you a few slides earlier. So that's shown on the right where, um, where we um, have our same sensitized mouse model and either feed them an alpha-gal safe port kidney homogenate or the unmodified sort of wild type port kidney. And what you can appreciate is that this, the same uh, drop in body temperature occurs. So this would argue that within the port kidney, it is specifically alpha-gal that is triggering uh, these reactions at the level of the mouse model. So I've, I've, um, I've done my best to try to convince you this is important, but I also think sometimes you, it, it's helpful to know that it's beyond just two dozen patients in 2009. So we, uh, we collaborate with, with the CDC and in, in conjunction with uh, Viracor Eurofins, they are the primary external testing lab for alpha-gal IgE in the US. Um, we were able to get a sense of the data. So the caveat is in, in allergy and immunology, just having IgE does not equal disease. So uh, there is a, a sensitization factor. That said, my sense is that physicians are sending this test because they suspect it clinically. So we think that the amount of cases that we're seeing through Viracor are probably pretty representative of what's out there. So over the past eight years, so this was 2010 to 2018 data, uh, they tested 122,000 specimens of uh, 105,000 people and 34,000 were positive. This was, by the way, way more than we ever thought. We had literally two dozen people in 2009, and now by 2018, we've, we know of 34,000. But because uh, Viracor is a reference lab, we don't always know where the specimens are coming from. Um, so of those that we, that we do know about, um, if you look in the middle column there, around 10,700 were from the South, um, but nearly 19,000 are unknown. When we look at the by zip code where uh, patients are coming from, you can see the, the testing over a five-year period, and it tends to be consistent with um, the original states reported in the uh, reactions to cetuximab, but equally, uh, this mirrors um, the distribution of the Lone Star Tick Amblyoma americanum. There's a, um, there's a website that we use for patients to sort of upload their own kind of crowdsourced data, if you will. So these, um, this is uh, called ZMAP and, and patients can go in and, and essentially drop a pin and then they can annotate it and some will say anonymous, some will give a, a name and their IgE level. Um, but it at least gives us a sense, certainly we're not capturing everyone, you really only go to the site if you know about it. Uh, we're not capturing everyone, but I think it at least gives us a sense of where alpha-gal allergy resides. Um, so you can see that, that Missouri has plenty of cases um, in the surrounding environment. It's equally become a global issue. Um, so we know of, of a fair number of cases in, in Sweden and in, in Scandinavia and Europe, uh, South Africa, Australia, and perhaps increasingly um, some in Japan as well. In these international um, cohorts, uh, it's different ticks. It, it is ticks as well, but it truly seems to be different ticks. So in Australia, Exodes holocyclus has been implicated. Um, in Sweden, Exodes ricinus. Um, and I also included this uh, data from um, one of the Japanese groups where they looked at repeated bites from the amblyoma tick that they have and showed that as uh, the number of tick bites increase on the y-axis, the alpha-gal IgE level increases on the x-axis. So hopefully I've convinced you that alpha-gal syndrome is an entirely new form of a food allergy that can break well-established oral tolerance. The reactions can be inconsistent, delayed. They can be 
GI specific. I usually tell our group, if you think AGS, just order the test. Um, evidence suggests that tick bites can affect total and specific IgE levels in some patients. And I think the data with the mouse model is fairly compelling to show that both tick salivary gland extract can drive an alpha-gal specific IgE response and the mice react when challenged with poor kidney and it seems to be an alpha-gal specific um, reaction. So with that, I think I'll stop there um, and glad to take any questions here or online. Yes. Yeah, it's a great question. So the question um, for those uh, listening in was, uh, could I comment on um, how often people have the allergy resolve? Um, and it does appear to resolve. It, it really seems as though when we look in the lab that um, the tick bites seem to create this um, plasma blast phenotype that doesn't really become a memory cell. And I think if they can avoid additional tick bites, it tends to be sort of a three to five year window. You're gonna have people on either side of that, um, but it, it will go away. Certainly doesn't go away for everyone. Um, and invariably some of our people that are, that are heavily bitten like park rangers and land surveyors, that memory, that, that plasma blast phenotype seems to become a memory cell. And I think in those patients, unfortunately, they're as best we can tell at the moment, they, they may have this um, for, for the good. Yes. Yeah, you, you are correct. It's a, it's a great question. The question was in the mouse model, the reaction did not seem to be delayed. And, and that, is, that is true. We, um, admittedly, we are gavaging them. Um, and it could be that the amount of, of alpha-gal in the pork kidney is, is ripe for absorption. And there's actually a human correlate of this. So in Germany, they have patients with AGS and they use pork kidney to challenge sometimes and because it's a delicacy. And those patients actually react much quicker. So it could be that the vehicle that we're using, it obviously could be a difference between mouse and human, but no, you're correct. In the, in the mouse model, they do react a little bit faster than say our colleagues that have a, a peanut, uh, a mouse model peanut allergy, but no, it's not, it's not, it's not ours. Um, yeah, it happens a bit more quickly. Maya? Yeah, also a good question. The, the question is about the source of the tick salivary gland extract and where those ticks come from. So uh, Dr. Karim rears them um, in Southern Mississippi, University of Southern Mississippi. Um, and they're from essentially the, the lab animal facility, they're fed on sheep. Um, and so, they're not sterilely reared, but the sheep are tested routinely for um, illness. So we know that they're, the ticks aren't infected. The, the possible exception of that is Rickettsia amblyommatis, which is a, um, it's thought to be non-pathogenic and is carried um, almost like a symbiont, but it, it's carried by uh, Amblyoma americanum, um, to the tune of 80 to 90% of them have this rickettsia amblyommatis, has been in, at times postulated perhaps to be involved with starry, but beyond that, it, the ticks are essentially Southern Mississippi um, in location and, and yeah, bred sterilely.
Right. So it's a great question. And this is one that fascinates us as well, which is what is it about the tick that, that makes this happen versus a mosquito? Um, so interestingly, our patients with AGS, we have a few that are beekeepers um, or otherwise get stung. And when they're stung, if we have enough, if we have, if we've monitored them closely, that will actually push their alpha-gal IgE as well. I, I haven't seen stinging insect cause the allergy, but I've seen it drive the IgE response once it's initiated. And my sense is, and this is early, but we're, we're a little bit focused on dipeptidyl peptidase number four, DPP4, um, which ticks have, stinging insects have. And when we look at the stinging insect components, it's the IgE that these, these patients have is not to the typical major component allergens in, in wasp, bee, and hornet. It's to minor components, but DPP4 is one that is present in the minor components and seems to be present in tick saliva as well. I just don't know if that's true or not true about mosquitoes. Um, but I think to your point, there are, there's specific enzymes that the ticks and perhaps the singing insects, but the ticks are carrying that, that mosquitoes don't. Yes. Oh, great. So the question was about AGS prevalence by blood group. Um, I find this actually a bit confusing because the, the, the literature is a bit scattered on it. Um, I can say that in our North Carolina cohort, um, we find that the blood group is not protective. And so the question um, originates in the biology of, of probably blood group B and AB because they are so similar blood group B, in fact, is so similar to alpha-gal, just differing by a few codes. So initially, we had, we had published that we, we thought that B or AB might be protective. And I think at the time, we just didn't have enough people enrolled to power the study. So in the Southeast, B and AB are both around 7% of the general population. So you, you need about an N of 5% four to 500 to really power that analysis. And my sense is that's where some of the confusion has been. Um, at this point, I don't see B or AB as protective because we have plenty of patients that have those blood groups, but they don't seem to get as high of an alpha-gal specific IgE response. So it may be that the blood group similarity sort of constrains the IgE response. I, I'm, I'm guessing, but that is one of the things that we're thinking about. I've got a couple here for the chat and I uh, wanna thank you again for being here as well. Um, Yeah, this is a, is a great question. So we're starting to think about this as well. You know, is there, are there things in the microbiome um, that, that become protective for, for various people? I, my sense is that there has to be some amount of host protection, but exactly what that is, we're not sure. Um, and this, I think, becomes sort of the, the next line of studies, which is to really enroll a large uh, human uh, cohort, follow them longitudinally and see if we can figure this out. Because we do hear from patients who will say, look, I've been bitten for years. I've lived in the same place. And, and now all of a sudden I've gotten this, which may actually point to the, that there may be something more specifically going on in the, in the ticks themselves. But um, we, we certainly can't rule that out at this point. Yeah, so the way that, um, and this is certainly not my expertise, but um, the approach, at least for Chagas disease, is that um, alpha-gal is an epitope uh, on the organism. And if we can boost the, the natural anti-gal response in humans, um, it may well be a way that we can sort of vaccinate against uh, Chagas disease, if you will. 
There are some um, emerging studies in the in mouse models, again, alpha-gal deficient mice, um, where they've boosted the anti-gal response with um, a, a, a virus-like particle. And in those animals, when they're challenged with Chagas disease, they, they, they have lower rates of infection. Um, and a similar approach has been taken with malaria. Thank you, my pleasure.